Hey everybody, Professor Dan here, and this is week 13 of History 3380, Business and American Society. And this week we're going to talk about Frederick Taylor and Henry Ford. And next week we're going to talk about David Sarnoff and RCA, which is the Radio Corporation of America. The week after that we're going to talk about Robert Noyce and the beginnings of Fairchild Semiconductor, which is really the, the forerunner of Intel. And then the last week, we're going to talk about Steve Jobs and Apple Computer. So we have a great three weeks coming up. Um, if you remember back to the beginning of the semester, we talked about the Springfield Armory in Springfield, Massachusetts, and we talked about the American system of manufacturing. And as you recall, that was this idea of manufacturing with interchangeable parts and this movement towards efficiency in manufacturing. And, and really, as we've studied various businesses throughout the past several weeks, this notion of efficiencies has been an important part of the success of business people. Even when we got into the Gilded Age and we read a little bit about Andrew Carnegie and John D. Rockefeller, the idea that both of those gentlemen specialized the manufacturing process of, of you know, steel or, or kerosene, respectively, um, you know, made their operations efficient and, and made them very profitable. So we're going to continue that idea this week as we move into the very late 1800s and the early 1900s with a gentleman named Frederick Taylor, and that's the first reading for this week. Uh, Frederick Taylor was really sort of the father of efficiency studies, so his thing was studying manufacturing processes and determining the one best way to make things. And, and the excerpt you're reading this week is from a book called The One Best Way by Robert Canigal that came out oh, quite a while ago because I read it in grad school. So it's pretty old at this point. But it's, it's, it's uh, one chapter you're going to read. And uh, again, Taylor went in and studied manufacturing processes and tried to determine the most efficient ways to manufacture something, whether it was how the workers moved, how things were placed in the factory, that sort of thing. Now, you know, to people that are into efficiencies, Taylor's really revered. To other people, he's not revered because he's thought to be the person who really led to this movement of de-skilling of workers. In other words, you know, taking craftsmanship out of manufacturing by making everything an assembly process. So you can understand both sides of that story. But I wanted you to know who Taylor was. If you're a Kobe student, that's a business innovation student, uh, you already know who Taylor is, and, and this reading you know, certainly will add to your knowledge. The other person we're going to talk about this week is Henry Ford. I think you all know who he is. Um, you know, there's all these misnomers out there that he invented the automobile and, and uh, invented the assembly line and that sort of thing. You know, most of those aren't true. Uh, the automobile was, um, you know, really, really the viable automobile was invented back in 1886 by Gottlieb Daimler. Uh, Ransom Olds in this country in Detroit was building cars before Ford did, Ford did in 1899. And the Dodge brothers were actually supplying engines to Ransom Olds back in 1899. And so you recognize some of these names, whether it be Dodge or Oldsmobile, uh, that were still around a century later. So, uh, you know, Ford was a mechanic, a tinker. He was brilliant when it came to mechanics. And um, he was hired by a gentleman named Malcolmson back in the early 1900s, uh, I think in 1903. Malcolmson was starting a car company and he wanted Ford to run it. So that was really the beginning of uh, the Ford Motor Company. And Ford's thing was manufacturing cars as efficiently as possible. Most biographers say that Ford got his idea for automobile assembly by observing the trolley in Chicago and the way the trolley moved along its tracks. Ford got the idea of really an automobile assembly line by using interchangeable parts and making the manufacturing as efficiently as possible. Now, he perfected that and it paid off because it allowed Ford to make cars uh, much more efficiently and therefore much more profitably and cheaper. Uh, 
than any of his competitors. I think that even back in the early 1900s, you know, he moved the time it took to build a car from like, you know, three, four hours down to like 30 minutes. So Ford could crank out a lot of cars in a hurry and therefore he could sell them for cheap. The other thing he did was he increased the wages of his factory workers. He was the first one with this notion of the $5 day, eventually the $6 day which was a lot more pay than anybody else was getting at the time. So he put his workers in a situation where they could actually afford the cars that they were making and that they tended to tolerate the, uh, the boredom of working in an assembly line situation more because they were being better paid. So he had some, some good ideas about manufacturing, some paternalistic ideas about labor, not all of them good, and you'll read a little bit more about that in the reading this week. Um, and the other thing was his idea that automobiles don't really need to be luxurious. They need to be inexpensive and they need to be reliable. So this whole notion of you can have any color you want as long as it's black sort of reflected this personality of Ford that you didn't need anything luxurious. You just needed something that worked. And that's what the Model T was all about. When he was developing the Model T, even the steel that was available in the U.S. wasn't really good enough for him. He was looking for a higher tensile strength steel, and he had to recruit an Englishman to, to uh, start making steel for him um, in, in Detroit because he had certain ideas about ways that things should be made. And so when it comes to that, he was really stubborn. So, you know, if we think about Thomas Edison, when we think about Rockefeller, when we think about Carnegie, and when we move forward to... A little bit to David Sarnoff and certainly to Steve Jobs, this idea of sort of a stubborn, there's the one best way to do things, is a personality trait that's consistent amongst all these people. So pay attention to that. Pay attention to Ford's personality, especially um, as, as, we read, as we start to read about Apple Computer in the weeks coming up. I think there's some interesting parallels there. So what happens with Ford is he has his way of looking at automobiles and the consumers of the time as we learned about last week are starting to identify themselves by what they own and not who they are so consumers started to want things different than the same car that everyone else had and at that time General Motors was coming online they offered a different variety of cars some of the cars more luxurious and the other thing GM did was they offered to sell cars on credit, which is something Henry Ford was totally against. So really, Ford started to lose his market share because he did not innovate as far as the cars he was selling, and he didn't sell on credit, and he didn't recognize that the consumer demands were you know, more important, obviously, than what he wanted to manufacture and the way he wanted to sell things. So there's a lesson to be learned there. There is one best way to manufacture things, and you can have a vision in, in your product that your product is best, but at the same time, if you don't have consumers, you're going to go nowhere as business people. So it's important to keep a pulse on uh, the consumer's desires in order to be successful. So I think that's really the story of Henry Ford, uh, this lack of innovation as far as uh, flexibility for consumers is concerned. And when we read about uh, David Sarnoff next week and RCA, Radio Corporation of America, it's the same type of thing. People are starting to move towards the integrated circuit, uh, the transistor radio, and Sarnoff still believes in vacuum tubes at RCA. So it's this idea of something an economist, Joseph Trumpeter, Trumpeter called uh, creative destruction, that if you don't obsolete yourself, someone else will. So that's really the lesson that we take away from Ford this week. I hope you all enjoy the reading. Uh, you're all doing a great job in class. Be safe. I'll see you next week.